Moby Dick, chapters fifty one to fifty three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Moby Dick by Herman Melville. Chapters 51 to 53. Chapter 51 The Spirit Spout. Days, weeks passed and under easy sail the ivory Pequod had slowly swept across four several cruising grounds, that off the Azores, off the Cape de Verdes, on the Plate, so called, being off the mouth of the Rio de la Plata, and the Carroll Ground, an unstaked watery locality southerly from St. Helena. It was while gliding through these latter waters that one serene and moonlight night, when all the waves rolled by like scrolls of silver, and by their soft, suffusing seethings made what seemed a silvery silence, not a solitude. On such a silent night a silvery jet was seen far in advance of the white bubbles at the bow. Lit up by the moon, it looked celestial, seemed some plumed and glittering god uprising from the sea. Fadala first described this jet for of these moonlight nights it was his wont to mount to the main masthead and stand a lookout there, with the same precision as if it had been day. And yet, though herds of whales were seen by night, not one whaleman in a hundred would venture a lowering for them. You may think with what emotions, then, the seamen beheld this old oriental, perched aloft at such unusual hours, his turban and the moon, companions in one sky. But when, after spending his uniform interval there for several successive nights, without uttering a single sound, when, after all this silence, his unearthly voice was heard announcing that silvery moonlit jet, every reclining mariner started to his feet, as if some winged spirit had lighted in the rigging, and hailed the mortal crew. "'There she blows!' Had the trump of judgment blown, they could not have quivered more, yet still they felt no terror, rather pleasure, for though it was a most unwanted hour, yet so impressive was the cry, and so deliriously exciting, that almost every soul on board instinctively desired a lowering. Walking the deck with quick side-lunging strides, Ahab commanded the tagallant sails and royals to be set, and every stunsail spread. The best man in the ship must take the helm. Then, with every masthead manned, the piled-up craft rolled down before the wind. The strange, upheaving, lifting tendency of the taffrail breeze, filling the hollows of so many sails, made the buoyant, hovering deck to feel like air beneath the feet, while still she rushed along as if two antagonistic influences were struggling in her, one to mount direct to heaven, the other to drive yawingly to some horizontal goal. And had you watched Ahab's face that night, you would have thought that in him also two different things were warring. While his one live leg made lively echoes along the deck, every stroke of his dead limb sounded like a coffin tap. On life and death this old man walked. But though the ship so swiftly sped, and though from every eye, like arrows, the eager glances shot, yet the silvery jet was no more seen that night. Every sailor swore he saw it once, but not a second time. This midnight spout had almost grown a forgotten thing, when some days after, lo, at the same silent hour, it was again announced, again it was described by all, but upon making sail to overtake it, once more it disappeared as if it had never been. And so it served us night after night, till no one heeded it but to wonder at it. Mysteriously jetted into the clear moonlight, or starlight as the case may be, disappearing again for one whole day, or two days, or three, and somehow seeming at every distinct repetition to be advancing still further and further in our van, this solitary jet seemed forever alluring us on. 
nor with the immemorial superstition of their race and in accordance with the preternaturalness as it seemed which in many things invested the pequod were there wanting some of the seamen who swore that whenever and wherever descried at however remote times or in however far apart latitudes and longitudes that unnearable spout was cast by one self-same whale and that whale moby dick for a time there reigned too a sense of peculiar dread at this flitting apparition as if it were treacherously beckoning us on and on in order that the monster might turn round upon us and rend us at last in the remotest and most savage seas these temporary apprehensions so vague but so awful derived a wondrous potency from the contrasting serenity of the weather in which beneath all its blue blandness some thought there lurked a devilish charm as for days and days we voyaged along through seas so wearily lonesomely mild that all space in repugnance to our vengeful errand seemed vacating itself of life before our urn-like prow but at last when turning to the eastward the cape winds began howling around us and we rose and fell upon the long troubled seas that are there when the ivory tusked pequod sharply bowed to the blast and gored the dark waves in her madness till like showers of silver chips the foam flakes flew over her bulwarks then all this desolate vacuity of life went away but gave place to sights more dismal than before close to our bows strange forms in the water darted hither and thither before us while thick in our rear view flew the inscrutable sea-ravens and every morning perched on our stays rows of these birds were seen and spite of our hootings for a long time obstinately clung to the hemp as though they deemed our ship some drifting uninhabited craft a thing appointed to desolation and therefore fit roosting place for their homeless selves and heaved and heaved still unrestingly heaved the black sea as if its vast tides were a conscience and the great mundane soul were in anguish and remorse for the long sin and suffering it had bred cape of good hope do they call you rather cape tormentoto as called of yore for long allured by the perfidious silences that before had attended us we found ourselves launched into this tormented sea where guilty beings transformed into those fowls and these fish seem condemned to swim on everlastingly without any haven in store or beat that black air without any horizon but calm snow-white and unvarying still directing its fountain of feathers to the sky still beckoning us on from before the solitary jet would at times be descried during all this blackness of the elements ahab though assuming for the time the almost continual command of the drenched and dangerous deck manifested the gloomiest reserve and more seldom than ever addressed his mates in tempestuous times like these after everything above and aloft has been secured nothing more can be done but passively to await the issue of the gale then captain and crew become practical fatalists so with his ivory leg inserted into its accustomed hole and with one hand firmly grasping a shroud ahab for hours and hours would stand gazing dead to windward while an occasional squall of sleet or snow would all but congeal his very eyelashes together meantime the crew driven from the forward part of the ship by the perilous seas that burstingly broke over its bows stood in a line along the bulwarks in the waist and the better to guard against the leaping waves each man had slipped himself into a sort of bowline secured to the rail in which he swung as in a loosened belt few or no words were spoken and the silent ship as if manned by painted sailors in wax day after day tore on through all the swift madness and gladness of the demoniac waves by night the same muteness of humanity before the shrieks of the ocean prevailed still in silence the men swung from the bolands still wordless ahab stood up to the blast 
even when wearied nature seemed demanding repose, he would not seek that repose in his hammock. Never could Starbuck forget the old man's aspect, when one night, going down into the cabin to mark how the barometer stood, he saw him with closed eyes sitting straight in his floor-screwed chair, the rain and half-melted sleet of the storm from which he had some time before emerged still slowly dripping from the unremoved hat and coat. On the table beside him lay unrolled one of those charts of tides and currents which have previously been spoken of. His lantern swung from his tightly clenched hand. Though the body was erect, the head was thrown back, so that the closed eyes were pointed towards the needle of the telltale that swung from a beam in the ceiling. Footnote. The cabin compass is called the telltale, because without going to the compass at the helm, the captain while below can inform himself of the course of the ship. End of footnote. Terrible old man! thought Starbuck, with a shudder. Sleeping in this gale, still thou steadfastly eyest thy purpose. CHAPTER 52 THE ALBATROSS Southeastward from the Cape, off the distant Crozettes, a good cruising ground for right whalemen, a sail loomed ahead, the Goni, Albatross by name. As she slowly drew nigh, from my lofty perch at the foremast head, I had a good view of that sight so remarkable to a tyro in the far ocean fisheries, a whaler at sea and long absent from home. As if the waves had been fullers, this craft was bleached like the skeleton of a stranded walrus. All down her sides this spectral appearance was traced with long channels of reddened rust, while all her spars and her rigging were like the thick branches of trees furred over with hoar-frost. Only her lower sails were set. A wild sight it was to see her long-bearded lookouts at those three mastheads. They seemed clad in the skins of beasts, so torn and bepatched the raiment that had survived nearly four years of cruising. Standing in iron hoops nailed to the mast, they swayed and swung over a fathomless sea, and though when the ship slowly glided close under our stern, we six men in the air came so nigh to each other that we might almost have leaped from the mastheads of one ship to those of the other, yet those forlorn-looking fishermen, mildly eyeing us as they passed, said not one word to our lookouts, while the quarter-deck hail was being heard from below. "'Ship ahoy! Have you seen the white whale?' But as the strange captain, leaning over the pallid bulwarks, was in the act of putting his trumpet to his mouth, it somehow fell from his hand into the sea, and the wind now rising amain, he in vain strove to make himself heard without it. Meantime his ship was still increasing the distance between. While in various silent ways the seamen of the Pequod were evincing their observance of this ominous incident at the first mere mention of the white whale's name to another ship, Ahab for a moment paused. It almost seemed as though he would have lowered a boat to board the stranger had not the threatening wind forbade. But taking advantage of his windward position, he again seized his trumpet, and knowing by her aspect that the stranger vessel was a Nantucketer, and shortly bound home, he loudly hailed, Ahoy there! This is the Pequod, bound round the world. Tell them to address all future letters to the Pacific Ocean. And this time three years, if I am not home, tell them to address them to— At that moment the two wakes were fairly crossed and instantly, then, in accordance with their singular ways, shoals of small, harmless fish, that for some days before had been placidly swimming by our side, darted away with what seemed shuddering fins, and ranged themselves fore and aft with the stranger's flanks. Though in the course of his continual voyagings Ahab must often before have noticed a similar sight, yet to any monomaniac man, the various trifles capriciously carry meanings. "'Swim away from me, do ye?' murmured Ahab, gazing over into the water. There seemed but little in the words, 
but the tone conveyed more of deep helpless sadness than the insane old man had ever before evinced but turning to the steersman who thus far had been holding the ship in the wind to diminish her headway he cried out in his old lion voice up helm keep her off round the world round the world there is much in that sound to inspire proud feelings but where to does all that circumnavigation conduct only through numberless perils to the very point whence we started where those that we left behind secure were all the time before us. Were this world an endless plain, and by sailing eastward we could forever reach new distances and discover sights more sweet and strange than any Cyclades or islands of King Solomon, then there were promise in the voyage. But in pursuit of those far mysteries we dream of, or in tormented chase of that demon phantom that, some time or other, swims before all human hearts while chasing such over this round globe they either lead us on in barren mazes or midway leave us whelmed chapter fifty three the gam the ostensible reason why ahab did not go on board of the whaler we had spoken was this the wind and sea betoken storms but even had this not been the case, he would not, after all, perhaps, have boarded her, judging by his subsequent conduct on similar occasions, if so it had been that, by the process of hailing, he had obtained a negative answer to the question he put. For, as it eventually turned out, he cared not to consort, even for five minutes, with any stranger captain except he could contribute some of that information he so absorbingly sought but all this might remain inadequately estimated were not something said here of the peculiar usages of whaling vessels when meeting each other in foreign seas and especially on a common cruising ground if two strangers crossing the pine barrens in new york state or the equally desolate salisbury plain in england if casually encountering each other in such inhospitable wilds these twain for the life of them cannot well avoid a mutual salutation and stopping for a moment to interchange the news and perhaps sitting down for a while and resting in concert then how much more natural that upon the illimitable pine barrens and salisbury plains of the sea two whaling vessels descrying each other at the ends of the earth off lone fanning's island or the far-away king's mills how much more natural, I say, that under such circumstances these ships should not only interchange hails, but come into still closer, more friendly and sociable contact. And especially would this seem to be a matter of course in the case of vessels owned in one seaport, and whose captains, officers, and not a few of the men are personally known to each other, and consequently have all sorts of dear domestic things to talk about for the long-absent ship the outward bounder perhaps has letters on board at any rate she will be sure to let her have some papers of a date a year or two later than the last one on her blurred and thumb-worn files and in return for that courtesy the outward bound ship would receive the latest whaling intelligence from the cruising ground to which she may be destined a thing of the utmost importance to her and in degree all of this will hold true concerning whaling vessels crossing each other's track on the cruising ground itself even though they are equally long absent from home for one of them may have received a transfer of letters from some third and now far remote vessel and some of those letters may be for the people of the ship she now meets besides they would exchange the whaling news and have an agreeable chat for not only would they meet with all the sympathies of sailors, but likewise with all the peculiar congenialities arising from a common pursuit and mutually shared privations and perils. Nor would difference of country make any very essential difference, that is, so long as both parties speak one language, as is the case with Americans and English, though to be sure from the small number of English whalers such meetings do not very often occur and when they do occur there is too apt to be a sort of shyness between them for your englishman is rather reserved 
and your Yankee, he does not fancy that sort of thing in anybody but himself. Besides, the English whalers sometimes affect a kind of metropolitan superiority over the American whalers, regarding the long, lean Nantucketer, with his nondescript provincialisms, as a sort of sea peasant. But where this superiority in the English whaleman does really consist, it would be hard to say, seeing that the Yankees in one day collectively kill more whales than all the English collectively in ten years. But this is a harmless little foible in the English whale hunters, which the Nantucketer does not take much to heart, probably because he knows he has a few foibles himself. So then, we see that of all ships separately sailing the sea, the whalers have most reason to be sociable, and they are so. Whereas some merchant ships crossing each other's wake in the mid-Atlantic will oftentimes pass on without so much as a single word of recognition, mutually cutting each other on the high seas like a brace of dandies in Broadway, and all the time indulging, perhaps, in finical criticism upon each other's rig. As for men of war, when they chance to meet at sea, they first go through such a string of silly bowings and scrapings, such a ducking of ensigns, that there does not seem to be much right-down hearty good will and brotherly love about it at all. As touching slave ships meeting, why they are in such a prodigious hurry they run away from each other as soon as possible. And as for pirates, when they chance to cross each other's crossbones, the first hail is, how many skulls, the same way that whalers hail, how many barrels, and that question once answered, pirates straightway steer apart, for they are infernal villains on both sides, and don't like to see over much of each other's villainous likenesses. But look at the godly, honest, unostentatious, hospitable, sociable, free and easy whaler. What does the whaler do when she meets another whaler in any sort of decent weather? She has a gam, a thing so utterly unknown to all other ships, that they never heard of the name even, and if by chance they should hear of it, they only grin at it, and repeat gamesome stuff about spouters and blubber boilers, and such like pretty exclamations. Why it is that all merchant seamen, and also all pirates and man-of-war's men, and slave-ship sailors, cherish such a scornful feeling towards whale-ships, this is a question it would be hard to answer. Because in the case of pirates, say, I should like to know whether that profession of theirs has any particular glory about it. It sometimes ends in uncommon elevation, indeed, but only at the gallows. And besides, when a man is elevated in that odd fashion, he has no proper foundation for his superior altitude. Hence I conclude that in boasting himself to be high lifted above a whaleman, in that assertion the pirate has no solid basis to stand on. But what is a gam? You might wear out your index finger running up and down the columns of dictionaries and never find the word. Dr. Johnson never attained to that erudition. Noah Webster's Ark does not hold it. Nevertheless, this same expressive word has now for many years been in constant use among some 15,000 true-born Yankees. Certainly it needs a definition, and should be incorporated into the lexicon. With that view, let me learnedly define it. Gam. Noun. A social meeting of two or more whale ships, generally on a cruising ground, when, after exchanging hails, they exchange visits by boats' crews, the two captains remaining for the time on board of one ship, and the two chief mates on the other. There is another little item about gamming which must not be forgotten here. All professions have their own little peculiarities of detail, so has the whale fishery. In a pirate, man of war, or slave ship, when the captain is rowed anywhere in his boat, he always sits in the stern sheets on a comfortable, sometimes cushioned seat there, and often steers himself with a pretty little milliner's tiller decorated with gay cords and ribbons. But the whale-boat has no seat astern, no sofa of that sort whatever, and no tiller at all. 
High times indeed, if whaling captains were wheeled about the water on casters, like gouty old aldermen in patent chairs. And as for the tiller, the whaleboat never admits of any such effeminacy, and therefore, as in gamming a complete boat's crew must leave the ship, and hence as the boat steerer or harpooner is of that number, that subordinate is the steersman upon the occasion, and the captain, having no place to sit in, is pulled off to his visit all standing like a pine tree. And often you will notice that being conscious of the eyes of the whole visible world resting on him from the sides of the two ships, this standing captain is all alive to the importance of sustaining his dignity by maintaining his legs. Nor is this any very easy matter, for in his rear is the immense projecting steering oar hitting him now and then in the small of his back, the after oar reciprocating by wrapping his knees in front. He is thus completely wedged before and behind, and can only expand himself sideways by settling down on his stretched legs. But a sudden violent pitch of the boat will often go far to topple him because length of foundation is nothing without corresponding breadth. Merely make a spread angle of two poles, and you cannot stand them up. Then, again, it would never do in plain sight of the world's riveted eyes, it would never do, I say, for this straddling captain to be seen steadying himself the slightest particle by catching hold of anything with his hands, Indeed, as token of his entire, buoyant self-command, he generally carries his hands in his trousers' pockets, but perhaps being generally very large, heavy hands, he carries them there for ballast. Nevertheless, there have occurred instances, well-authenticated ones too, where the captain has been known for an uncommonly critical moment or two, in a sudden squall, say, to seize hold of the nearest oarsman's hair, and hold on there like grim death. End of chapters 51 to 53